Section 8 of Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 5, by Julian Hawthorne, Editor. Section 8. The Singer, by Wilhelm Hauff. Part one. one. It is a strange occurrence, truly, said Councillor Bolnau to a friend he met on Broad Street, in B. You must confess that it is a queer age we live in. You mean the affair in the north, answered his friend. Have you important news, Councillor? Has your friend, the foreign minister, told you some important secret of state? Oh, don't bother me with politics or state secrets. Let them go as they may. I mean now the affair of Mademoiselle Bianatti. The little singer? Has she been engaged again? They say the conductor of the orchestra has quarreled with her. But for heaven's sake, cried the councillor in astonishment, where have you been hiding yourself that you do not know what all the city knows? Have you not heard what has happened to our little Bianetti? Not a word, on my honour. What is it, then? Nothing further than that she was stabbed to death last night. The councillor was known as a great joker. When he made his usual morning promenade up and down Broad Street, it was his habit to stop his friends and tell them some wonderful story. This particular friend, therefore, was not much shocked at such terrible news. Instead he answered calmly, Is that all you know today, Bolnau? Your imagination must have given out if you exaggerate to this extent. When you stop me another time, have something more sensible to tell me. Otherwise, I shall turn down another street if I see you in the distance. He won't believe me, cried the councillor. He won't believe me. If I had told you that the Emperor of Morocco had been stabbed, you would have received the news with gratitude, and would have carried it further, because such news from Morocco is nothing unusual. But if they kill a singer here in B, nobody will believe it until they see the funeral. But, my dear friend, it is true this time, as true as that I am an honest man. Man, think of what you're saying, cried the friend in horror. Dead, you say? Mademoiselle Bionetti dead? She was not dead up to an hour ago, but I heard that she was in a very bad way. But tell me more, for mercy's sake. Are we in Italy, then, that people can be stabbed to death here in our city? Where is our police? How could it have happened? Don't scream so, good friend, replied Bolnau soothingly. People are looking at us from the windows. How it happened, you ask? That is just the point. No one knows how it happened. Yesterday evening the young singer was at the masked ball, as charming and amiable as ever, and at twelve o'clock last night court physician Lang was awakened from a sound sleep and told that Signora Bionetti was dying of a knife wound. The whole city is talking of it. Rank nonsense, of course. There are several circumstances which make it difficult to find out the truth. For instance, she will allow no one to enter her house except the doctor and her own serving people. The court knows the news already, and the order has been given that the watch should not go through that street. The entire battalion makes the detour over the market-place. You don't say so. But does no one know how it could have happened? Have they no clue at all? It is difficult to pick out the truth among the many rumours that are going about. Our little Bionetti is a very decent girl, one must acknowledge. There is nothing that could be said against her reputation. But people are malicious, particularly our dear ladies. If one mentions the respectable life the poor girl leads, they will shrug their shoulders and hint that they know all sorts of things from her past. Her past! Dear Lord, the child is scarce seventeen years old, and has been here for a year and a half, what chance is there for a past there? Do not linger so long on the preface, interrupted his friend, but come to the main theme of your story. Do they know who stabbed her? Why, that is just the point, as I have already told you. People insist that it is some rejected lover, or else a jealous lover, who has tried to kill her. There are strange circumstances surrounding the case. They say that at the ball yesterday evening she was seen talking for some time with a masked man whom no one knew. She left the hall shortly after that, 
and there are those who claim to have seen that the man drove away with her in her carriage. This is all that any one knows for certainty, but I will soon find out how much truth there is to it. Yes, I know that you have your own channel for news. You have probably secured someone around those surrounding the signora who will keep you aware of everything that happens. People call you the city chronicler. Too much honor, laughed the counselor, and appeared flattered. But this time I have no other spy than Dr. Lang himself. You must have noticed that, quite contrary to my usual custom, I am not promenading up and down the length of the street, but am confining myself to this block. I have noticed it, but I thought you were endeavoring to attract the eye of the fair Madame Baruch. Do not talk to me of the Baruchs. We broke off with them three days ago. My wife says that Madame Baruch plays for too high a stake. No, Dr. Lang comes through this street every day at twelve o'clock on his way to the palace. I am standing here to catch him when he comes around the corner. Let me remain with you, said his friend. I want to hear more about this affair. Oh, my dear friend, don't take the trouble to do that, replied Bolnau. I know that you dine at twelve o'clock. Do not allow your soup to grow cold, and furthermore, Lang may not talk so freely before you. Meet me this afternoon in the café, and I will tell you everything. But go now, there he comes around the corner. 2. I do not consider the wound to be necessarily fatal, said court physician Lang after the first greeting. The knife was not held very securely in the hand that dealt the blow. She is conscious again, and, apart from the weakness which has followed the great loss of blood, there is no immediate danger. The counsellor put his arm through the doctor's and answered, I am very glad to hear that. I'll walk with you these few blocks to the palace. But do you tell me something more about this affair? No one seems to know anything definite about the manner in which it happened. I can assure you, said the other, the whole affair is shrouded in the deepest mystery. I had just fallen asleep when my Johann awakened me with the news that I had been sent for to come and see some very sick person. I threw on my clothes and ran to the next room, where I found a pale and trembling girl who whispered to me that I was to bring bandages with me. This began to attract my attention. I entered the carriage hastily, told the maid to sit on the box with Johann to show him the way, and we drove to Lindenhof. I got down before a small house, and asked the maid who the sick person was. I can imagine how astonished you were. When I heard that it was Signora Bianetti, I only knew her on the stage, had seen her there scarcely two or three times, but the mysterious way in which I had been called to her, the bandages I was told to bring, all this aroused my curiosity greatly. We mounted a short stair and went through a narrow dark hall. The maid led the way, left me there in the darkness a few moments, and then returned sobbing and even paler than before. "'Come in, please, doctor,' she said. "'Alas, I fear you are too late. She will not live through it.' I entered the room. It was, indeed, a terrible sight. The physician was quiet a moment, his face darkening. He seemed to be looking at some picture which depressed him. "'Well, and what did you see?' cried his companion, impatient at the interruption. "'I have seen many things in my life.' continued the doctor, after a pause. Many things that have alarmed me, many things that have aroused my pity, but I have seldom seen anything that so touched my heart as did the sight that met my eyes there. In a dimly lighted room, a pale young woman lay stretched out upon the sofa. An old servant knelt beside her, holding a cloth to her heart. I came near. The head of the dying woman lay thrown back, white and fixed as the head of a statue. Her long black hair, her dark eyebrows and lashes, formed a terrifying contrast with the startling whiteness of her forehead, her face, and her beautiful rounded throat. The full folds of her white garments, which were doubtless part of her masquerade costume, were stained with blood. There was blood upon the floor and upon the sofa, blood that poured out from her heart in a crimson stream. This was what I saw in that first moment. Then I recognized that it was the singer Bianetti. "'Oh, how very touching!' said the counsellor, much moved, and wiping his eyes with a large silk handkerchief. She lay just like that a week ago, when she sang Desdemona. The effect was so alarmingly real, one could almost think that the moor had really killed her, and to think that such a thing should in very truth happen to her. 
Did I not forbid you to allow yourself to become excited? Interrupted the physician. Do you want to bring on another attack? You are right, said the counselor, putting his handkerchief back in his pocket. You are right. My constitution does not permit me any excitement. Continue to tell me what you know, and I will count the window panes in the war office as we pass. That helps to calm me. If that doesn't help you, you might take the second story of the palace also. The old servant removed the cloth, and to my astonishment I saw a wound very near the heart, which had evidently been made by a knife or a dagger. There was no time to ask questions, however much I may have wished to do so. I examined the wound, and bound it up. During the operation the wounded girl had given no sign of life, except that she had started and quivered when I probed the wound. I let her rest, just as she lay, and watched her slumbers carefully. But the two serving-maids, did you not question them about the wound? You are my good friend, counsellor, therefore I will confess to you that when I had bound up the wound and could do no more for the moment, I told the servants that I would do nothing more for the lady until they gave me some explanation as to what had happened. And what did they say? That the singer came home shortly after eleven o'clock in company with a tall man who wore a mask. I may have shown some expression in my face at this news, for the two women began to weep, and implored me not to think ill of their young lady. They had been with her for some time, they said, and they had never seen any man enter the house after four o'clock in the afternoon. The young girl, who probably had been reading romances, said that the signora was an angel of purity. I would say that myself, said the counsellor, busily counting the window-panes in the palace, which they were approaching. I would say that myself. One can find nothing to say against Signora Bianetti. She is a good, pious child. Is it her fault that she is beautiful, and that she must support herself by her singing? You can believe me, replied Lang. A physician can see deeply in these matters. One look at the pure features of the unhappy girl convinced me of her innocence far more than did the vows of her handmaiden. The latter, probably from curiosity as to this strange midnight visit, had remained near the door. She heard excited words pass between her mistress and the stranger, who had a deep, hollow voice. They spoke in French. The signora finally began to weep bitterly, and the man cursed horribly. Suddenly she heard a sharp scream in her mistress's voice. Alarmed at this, she opened the door, and the man in the mask rushed hastily past her and through the hall to the stairs. The maid followed him for a few steps, and heard a great noise at the bottom of the staircase, a noise as if he had fallen. She heard him groaning and moaning, but she was too terrified to go a step farther in that direction. She ran back into the room, where the lady lay covered with blood, her eyes closed as if she were dead. The girl was so alarmed that she did not know what to do at first. She awoke the old woman, told her to do what she could for their mistress, while she herself ran to fetch me. And Signora Bianetti herself has said nothing? Did you not question her? I went to the police station at once and awoke the commissioner. He ordered a search of all the taverns and of all dark corners in the city where criminals are wont to hide. No one had passed the gates in that last hour, and orders went out that any one who passed after that should be examined. The owners of the little house, who lived in the upper story, did not even know of the affair until the police came to search their dwelling. It is quite incredible that the murderer could have escaped, for he must have injured himself severely in his fall down the stairs. The lower stairs were stained with blood. It is likely that he wounded himself with his own dagger. It is still more impossible to understand how he could have escaped, as the house door was closed. Signora Bianetti became conscious at ten o'clock this morning, and when examined by the chief of police, declared that she had no idea who the man in the mask could be. All physicians and surgeons are compelled, as you perhaps know, to report any such wounds at once to the authorities, to aid in the capture of the murderer. This is the affair as it stands now, but I am convinced that there is some deep secret here which the singer will not reveal. Signora Bianetti is not the sort of woman who would allow a strange man to accompany her home at that hour. Her handmaiden, who was present at the examination, seems to suspect something of the kind, for, when she saw that the signora did not intend to say anything, she herself said nothing about the quarrel she had heard, and threw me a look which seemed to implore me to be silent also. This is a terrible affair, she said as she led me out to the stairway again. 
but nobody in the world can make me betray what my senora does not wish to have known. Then she confessed something else to me, something which may throw light on this sad affair. Well, and may I not know what this something else is? asked the counsellor. You see how curious I am. Do not keep me in suspense, if you do not wish me to have one of my attacks. Tell me, Bolnau, do you know whether there is any one else of your name in this city? Or do you know of any one of that name anywhere else in the world? And if you do, where is he, and who is he? I know of no one else in this town, answered Bolnau. When I moved here about eight years ago, I was pleased to think that my name was not Meyer or Mueller or anything else that one finds by the dozen, causing great trouble and inconvenience. In Cassel, I was the only man in my family, and I know of no other Bolnau in the whole world except my son, that unhappy, music-mad fool. He has gone to America, I believe, and has disappeared altogether. But why do you ask this question, doctor? Well, it can't be meant for you, counsellor and your son is in America, but it is already a quarter past twelve o'clock. Princess Sophie is ill, and here I stand chatting with you. Farewell, and au revoir. You don't move one step, cried Bolnau, holding the doctor's arm, until you tell me what the girl said. I will, but you must not reveal it to a soul. The singer's last word, breathed just as she sank down to unconsciousness, was Bolnau. Three. No one had ever seen Councillor Bolnau in so serious and gloomy a mood as he was after he had parted from Dr. Lang in front of the palace. He was usually so cheery and bright when he made his morning promenade, and he had such an amiable smile for all the ladies he met, such merry jokes for his men-friends, that no one would have taken him to be sixty years old. He had, indeed, all possible cause for cheeriness. He had made a neat fortune for himself, had won the title of Counselor of Commerce, and then had retired to enjoy life in his pretty home in B, in company with his wife, who was as fond of all good things as he was himself. He had one son, whom he had intended to make his successor in business, but the boy had but one interest, his love for music. All business, trading, and commerce was hateful to him. The father had a hard, stubborn head, the son also, the father was apt to be violent and exaggerated in excitement. The son also. When the son had just passed twenty, the father was fifty years old, and ready to retire and leave his business to his son. But one fine summer evening, the son disappeared, taking nothing with him but a few piano scores of his favorite operas. From England he wrote his father a friendly letter, saying that he was going to America. The counselor wished him good luck for his journey, and then moved his household to be. The thought of this music-mad fool, as he dubbed his son, rendered many an hour gloomy for him. He had told the boy never to show himself before him again. Hence, he knew that he need never expect to see his son unless he sent for him. It seemed to him at times that he had been foolish to insist on putting the boy into trade. But years passed, and a busy life of pleasure gave him little time for sad thoughts. His days were spent in seeking for amusement, and if one wanted to behold him at his merriest, one could do it easily between eleven and twelve o'clock in Broad Street. There one could see a tall, thin man, in modishly cut garments with a lorgnette and a riding-whip, whose quick movements contrasted amusingly with his grey hairs. He bowed incessantly to the right and to the left, stopping every two paces to talk to some one and to laugh merrily. If one were a stranger and saw such a man at the hour named, one could be certain that it was Councillor Bolnau. But today all was different. If the news of the sad accident to the singer had excited him, the doctor's last words threw him into a fright that almost lamed him. Her last word before she became unconscious was Bolnau. She had spoken his honest name under such suspicious circumstances. His knees trembled, his head drooped. Bolnau, he thought. Bolnau, royal counsellor of commerce. Suppose the singer were to die, and the maidservant were to tell her secret. The police authorities would then know all about the murder, and all about this terrible last word. What could not a clever, ambitious lawyer make of this single word, some young man who was anxious to make a name by a cause celeb? The counsellor put up his lorgnette, and stared in despair at the prison, the gables of which he could just see in the distance. 
That would be your goal, Bolnau. Perhaps they would make it a short term only, because of many years of faithful service to your country. He breathed heavily and loosened his cravat, then dropped his hand with a start of terror. Was not that the spot the rope encircled? That the cold steel cut through? If he met an acquaintance who bowed to him, he said to himself, He knows about it already, and wants to show me that he understands. If another friend passed hastily without seeing him, then he was sure that this person knew also all about it and did not wish any further acquaintance with a murderer. A little more, and he would soon come to believe that he himself had really committed the murder. It was no wonder that he made a wide curve to avoid the police station. Might not the commissioner be standing at the window, see him, and call down to him, Come up here this moment, I have a word to say to you. He already felt guilty trembling in all his limbs. He was already conscious of a desire to control all possible emotion in his face. Was it not he whom the unfortunate singer had accused with her last word? Then he suddenly remembered that all this emotion was exceedingly bad for his health. He looked eagerly about for window panes to count, but the houses danced before his eyes, and the church steeple seemed to drop him a mocking curtsy. A terror of alarm seized him. He ran hastily through the streets until he sank down breathless in his own armchair. His first question, when he had come to himself again, was whether anyone from the police station had come to ask for him. End of section 8